Yeah, I, I mean, I'll start off. I mean, um, <laughs> it's funny. I was chatting to Curry earlier today. I, I've got a nine-year-old daughter, and I decided that we what we were thinking like, what movie should we watch? And we watched Artificial Intelligence by Steven Spielberg. Um, and I was just saying to Curry, you know, this, I have this kind of um, weird kind of double-edged sword view of AI. You know, it's kind of like. In some respects, I think it could be fantastic. Um, you know, in certain ways, like, for example, you get autistic people who communicate in a certain way um, and they might actually benefit from AI technologies or, or AI, super, you know, superior toys that are created where they can communicate in a certain way. Um, and then on the other hand, I'm thinking, can AI be something that can connect really well with a human being can they learn our emotions you know can they learn the way we are and can we connect in a good way in that sense so <laughs> it's funny i watched that tonight and it was like it was a very emotional film actually it's a very emotional film and that's kind of like the weird irony of it because ai is like you could argue they're not emotional they don't have the emotional ability like humans but that film is so emotional because obviously the kid tries to like find his mom, um, you know, over a long period of time. And then he gets to spend like one day with her. I think it is, you know, he spends one day with her because, you know, the extraterrestrial benevolent beings that he encounters make that happen. Um, so there's that kind of weird thing, but so, you know, I was thinking about that today and I was thinking about, the internet as well, it's always a double-edged sword. It's like the internet can connect people rapidly, yet it's also very divisive. It's also very, you know, it, it takes away the human element to some extent, yet we can connect with people so rapidly. So I just, you know, wondered, what do you think about that, Mark? You know, that weird double-edged sword thing. So AI is an interesting film because, in fact, the most emotional characters in that movie are all of the machines. And I don't think that's an accident. You take a look, because the film was originally a Kubrick script. He passed away, so Spielberg stepped in to direct it. Mm -hmm. And the other film yeah. that Kubrick is known for is 2001. And the most emotional being in 2001 is Hal as he's losing his mind. Yeah, yeah. So there's a real theme here that human beings can, I guess, make choices that turn them into machines while the mm -hmm. machines are struggling to deal with the emotions that come with being in the world of relational beings, you know, beings yeah. that are not just yeah. transactional. And it comes into that whole idea of the internet. We've actually learned now how to design spaces that can emphasize transactionality or emphasize relationality. And when you re mm -hmm. emphasize relationality, you also then have choices. Are you going to amplify the negative aspects? Are you going to amplify the positive aspects? Are you going to amplify the moderate aspects? So yeah. that we kind of have some dials to our souls so that we can start to tune a little bit. And we have to be very careful because people are using them for all of their own purposes, which might not be yours when you're engaged with that machinery. You know, I don't know the exact story in detail, but I think there was a woman in Virginia who claims like a, a Furby I think it was a Furby, helped her autistic son to speak. So I don't know all the details yes. of this story, only that, you know, the lady in question, the mother, um, I think her name was Lisa Cantara, said that a Furby taught her four-year-old son how to refer to himself in speech. Um, and he increased his vocabulary by about half a dozen words or something like that. So what I'm saying is that is a positive aspect of AI. Because I know, I know a lot of people are, are kind of like, oh, God, it's, it's totally inhuman. And, you know, if we start getting into all this kind of thing, it's taking away from the human emotions and everything. But there are some very positive aspects to it, too, 
I don't know what you think about that, Mark. And, I'm trying to remember if I brought that story into my book, The Playful World, that I wrote in 2000. I think oh, sure. I did. Uh, because I talked, oh, there was a whole section about the Furby. And in fact, the Furby was the whole inspiration to write that book. Oh, because right. Back in, I've not read that book, Mark. But so in 98, I saw Sherry Turkle give a talk at MIT. And she just finished doing some work with four, five, and six-year-olds. And she'd right. given them a Furby for two weeks. And then she'd just taken it back. And then she sat down with them and she asked them a series of questions. And one of the questions she asked, I think the key question was, is the Furby more like your dog or is it more like your doll? Mm. And the key thing she's really asking there, she's asking, is it animate or inanimate? This is one of the first categories that we start to conceptualize as children, the quick and the dead. And the kids created a new category. They said, it's not like either of them. It's something that's not either of them. And when she told that story, a light bulb went off in my head. And it said, there's something about the Furby that's actually getting kids to conceive of the world differently. That's giving them a new category. And it's the category that in many circumstances, AI falls into. The beautiful thing about a child who's not neurotypical and a Furby is that a Furby can repeat and repeat and repeat without getting exhausted. And a person who's not neurotypical often thrives on that kind of repetition as a way to learn, but also because it provides safety for them because stimulus is harder for them to incorporate. So there was a whole bunch of reasons why a Furby is a really good learning tool. You also see the same thing happening now with certain smartphone-based apps that can also be very repetitive when someone is trying to acquire language. You know, this is, hi, Mark. Uh, this is kind of interesting uh, because my uncle who uh, has dementia, um, the further he got uh, into it, he started using Facebook as a way to navigate yeah. and use pictures to, to say, Oh, he knew who I was, but then he had to look at Facebook to get my name and said, Daniel, here you are. But he knew everything. He just needed the words and he, he used the, uh, the images more to, to communicate. Yeah. And we see one of my very good friends here had his, as his father was going into dementia, he had a little old MacBook that had all these notes on it. And at some point they were going to clean it off and they realized before they deleted it that that was his memory that he had externalized his memory as a compensation. And you can see, I mean, I think people have always done this. They would leave, they would just leave notes around the house before this, things like this. But as we get these different kinds of tools, we're using all of the tools at hand to externalize some of the things that aren't working as well for us. What we could hope for with artificial intelligence is an artificial intelligence that grows up with us that has always been friends with us from the time that we're born and so is so intimate with how our mental processes are working it's very good at both mirroring them and supporting them through our lives that's i think a goal worth working toward because it's a very human goal it's a goal that helps us be more human rather than less so is this kind of like externalizing our internal monologue that we have with ourselves? It, if it's externalized, it probably doesn't look quite the same as what's going on inside. Uh -huh. Cause when you cross the boundary, you also cross the boundary between the imagination and the physical, right? And that boundary yeah. is a linguistic, imaginal, psychological, magical boundary. And things don't, when they cross that boundary, they aren't the same on either side, right? They take different yeah. form. But the answer to that is kind of yes, in that different form, we're taking what we understand to be true inside of ourselves and putting it out in the world so that we can remember that it's true. Yeah, you know, this is interesting because me and Curry have been talking about this idea of using our a, um, VR space as this kind of like um, puzzle, but we have this like little sidekick who's your ally that follows you along in this puzzle that you could go to and ask some questions, but he's learning along with you. So you're, so the first room would be Will and Ms. Burrell's like mind palace. And so you're teaching the first little AI character, Will and Ms. Burrell's. So then when later you got to say, uh, what is language? Oh, language is a virus from outer space. And then you could go into like the cut up method and then you get into what Burrell's is doing, but you have your ally to help you like remember 
what's going on and what's key and how you make connections to go on into the next like room or whatever it is. And, you know, we see all the way back in 93 with the placeholder project, which is Rachel Strickland and Brenda Laurel, that when they created a virtual world, they created a place to store audio placeholders so that this was the very first multi-user virtual world. You could have two people in it at once. And at that time, it took millions of dollars of technology to be able to do that. But part of the feature was that people could add basically a little entity, almost a clickable object that had their own voice in it so they could record something, whether it was a memory of this place or part of the story they wanted this place to hold. And they called those the placeholders. And so over the period of time that the work was installed at the BAMP Center for the Arts up in Canada, it acquired a number of placeholders as people added their own memories inside the virtual world for other people to help them experience the space. Yeah, because you need just like with any new place, you need a navigator. Like you, you're going on a trip and you're going to a new. Um, like I go to Boston, I don't really know anybody there. So then, you know, I try to find you know little ma uh, maps to try to find my way, or or maybe where me, I kind of go where my family is. So I go and visit a family and I stay at their house and they show me around. But in this space. You know, earlier I was in a team human space and we were using high fidelity with Doug. And, and so you could move away from people and you don't hear them. And then you kind of get disorientated and you're trying to like turn around and you get lost and then you don't know how to zoom out. And then it'll be good for someone because we spent the whole 20 minutes just saying about like how weird the space is. Like, how do we get from here to there? And like, that's all we did in the beginning is just navigate and ourselves. And a lot of that is because you've so disconnected it from what's innate to your body, what your body has experienced all of its life, all of your life, all of that nature has been alienated away. And, you know, you can't, in some sense, you can't blame the technology or even the designers at that. All you can say is it's still 30 years in, very early days here. And there is... The thing that it's shown us, and it's funny because this is also true for artificial intelligence, they really thought in 1956 at the Dartmouth AI conference, which is the first major conference in AI, that they'd kind of have it sorted within about 10 years. They truly thought this. And again, virtual reality, which has been with us about 40 years now, not quite, 35, 40 years, so mid 80s. They kind of thought we would have this sorted out by now. The thing that both of these show us Artificial intelligence showed us that we knew nothing about our own intelligence and that, in fact, it becomes the reflective device for the exploration of what intelligence actually is. Virtual reality turns out to be an exploration for what perception is and what embodied perception is. And the further we get into VR, the more we understand we don't know much about that. Yeah, it's it's uh, it kind of goes back to... Um you know, what you were saying in, in bios and logos and even to the extent in um, augmented uh, reality is that with language, we have been augmenting our perception through stories and this has been accelerating. Um, I guess maybe you want to to map out that of the, the larger picture of the progression of bios and logos. So, I mean, this is, the conversation of history, and you know, this is as much, I think, probably my getting my influences from Tim Larry and Terence McKenna and Doug uh, in all of this, and Robert Anton Wilson, but there's a conversation uh, which is the historic conversation, which is the conversation between both humans in time and humans and the material world through time. And it's the emergence of our being in the world and our abilities within the world that are a conversation. And I, I frame this as talking to the hand. You know, there's that old phrase, talk to the hand, where you don't want to talk to someone. But in fact, what we've been doing with technology is having this conversation. And I did this as a piece called Antos and Techne, which also talks about this in similar detail, um, that we're having a conversation with the hand, that the hand is in fact changing the world, but there's a feedback loop. The hand changes the world, the mind and the perceptions look at those changes and then build models based on those changes and then direct the hand to make more changes. And so what you do is you build up a history, a story, 
and an inertia around this. And some of that then starts to sort of shade into dialectical materialism, which is then Hegel and Marx. And you get to this sort of dialectical theory of history where everything is kind of set in stone and there are certain stages of historic development and blah, 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 blah. And you could say, yeah, whatever, but then you can then bring in, as Terence McKenna did, Alfred North Whitehead and this idea of process philosophy, that in fact, time itself is a medium and that the expression of what we learn in time, the expression of ideas in time has and ebb and flow and ideas intersect and produce concrescences where they produce something new. They produce novelty as two things intersect. And that then provides something new to tell the hand, something new to delight the mind. And so we're all wrapped in this very long history, this very long story telling process. Now, let me just make a little side note here because it's something that's very much front of my mind right now. I'm talking to you from Sydney, Australia, and Australia has the privilege of having the oldest continuous recorded culture on the planet. The First Nations of Australia, the indigenous people, the aboriginals, and there are many different groupings of them, something around 150 different distinct language groupings and tribal groupings. They have something around, and it could be more than, when I arrived in this country, 17 years ago, it was believed that history went back 45,000 years. It is now attested to 60,000 years. It could well be beyond that, but there's continuous culture along that stretch of time, which means there's that continuous story. And we know that these cultures are bound by their stories, by their dreamings, that there's an enormous wealth of that knowledge there that we're only just starting to appreciate and we're only just starting to explore. So this story that we're telling ourselves actually has an entire dimension that in some sense we've kept ourselves from, we've blinded ourselves to, and that we're starting to open up to. And that may then change every other story we've told since then because it becomes part of something that is not just a little bit bigger, but is 10 times bigger than the 6,000 years of history. This reminds me of when you're talking about the hand and shaping is when I dug into the etymology of weird and it goes to Beowulf and how maybe in the pagan way of using it, it both meant something that is shaped and someone who's shaping. So both your destiny and your own will with your hands that you shape and that it's this whole ebb and flow between the two of your own personal will and the overall will of like the galaxy or the, the, the destiny. And this is what we're just playing out, you know, constantly. And thank you for, for, for feeding me that line. Cause I have to tell you after I did my interview with Doug and that went to air, you know, in January or whatever, I had people approach me because we talked about my magic practice in that. And we, I had people approaching me wanting to further their knowledge. And as I engaged them in a discussion about where they were, which I think is kind of the place that I want to start from when I start to talk about these things with people, I could see that they were viewing magic very instrumentally, that it was a tool in hand for them to use their will to change the world. And I really had to take that and turn that around and say, well, what if magic is holding us and we're the tool, right? And I feel like we need to grasp that, that that is in fact always the, the right way because it's the humble way to approach anything like this is to accept that in fact we are the tool in hand rather than the hand holding the tool. Yeah, and this this goes back to, I think I was reading um, Doug's um, um, Adolf and um, Alistair and the big struggle is between, you know, Hitler's will of his own uh, charging his sigil with with Alistair trying to hook it to something older and bigger than his will and to the greater universe. He's like, the only thing that could defeat Hitler is the universe. And yeah. uh, it's kind of interesting when you get to a lot of these tales of anybody's trips. And I think I remember this one, um, I think it's the way of the shaman and this guy goes down to to the Amazon and, and takes ayahuasca and he has like the end time um, 
kind of vision and he's like really freaking out and he goes to a, a blind shaman and he asks the blind shaman and he tells him the vision and he's like oh yeah he's like you know those people that say they're in charge they're only in charge of this little area don't worry about them they they talk a lot of stuff and they're, they're they they can show here but they don't know anything like they, the the universe is so vast like don't pay attention to them <laughs> I like that. That's because it's completely just reframing them into insignificance, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, those guys over there, they have their little playground. They're doing their little things. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about them. <laughs> and that that feels like a very powerful oh, magic. magic. I am constantly yeah. these days, constantly, constantly reminded, reminded of, of this wonderful, wonderful line that's in Schrodinger's Cat by Robert Anton Wilson, which is that um, history is the place where rival gangs, or actually reality is the place where rival gangs of shaman fought to a standstill. Yeah, that <laughs> you is know? What, what we're all uh, battling on of what, I, I think this is what goes to your book, Augmented to Reality, of like, who's going to be able to frame and write what is the next um, story and medium that we all get entrapped in. And this is going to set like the pace for humanity going forward after the guess the end of this old history of how i guess it was going up to this point i don't know i don't know that's where we are now yeah i don't i don't i don't think we get to escape history because history is karma right our history <laughs> does shape the way we conceive of our actions in the future i mean the the great promise of psychedelics in the 50s and 60s, less so in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, was that it was supposed to release you at least temporarily from your imprints, to put it into purely scientific language, right? That it would release you from your imprinted behavior. And I think that there is a dizzying sense of freedom that associates with what the shoguns would call a plus three or plus four experience in that range, which is that release from the imprinted behavior. And you can see it, particularly with the empathogens. So MDMA is the classic response with MDMA is that the boundaries are dissolved and one loves the whole universe because the things that keep one from experiencing the boundless sea of love have been chemically taken out of play for a period of time. And so there was that hope there that that could lead to a kind of rebooting of history. But my feeling is that what was important about that was the sense that it was possible to do that. I don't know that that is necessarily the specific mechanism. I think it is the specific mechanism, particularly for people who are experiencing, say, end of life. And we know that psilocybin therapy and MDMA therapy are incredibly important for people to resolve some of the things that they're feeling as they're facing their, their mortality, right? But I think on a broader cultural level, it was simply that way of reminding us that we don't always have to be enacting the same script. Then in fact, we can toss the script out and we can start with a fresh page. But, and as I said, when I was talking to Doug, that is incredibly frightening to people because it does amount to a death. When you toss the script out, you've killed all the characters. You have to start with new characters. You have to start with a fresh pen and fresh ideas and I think almost everyone is almost always going to find that terrifying. Yeah, and this this is where you know uh, Doug and and you guys have said uh, about the psychedelic mindset of being able to maybe play in the space a little bit better. Of saying because when when I look at um, the VR space, I was thinking, okay, what fun can I have with this? Like. Mm -hmm. How do I tell a story with this? And because I experienced, you know, these map uh, VRs with the head goggles, and I went through it. But I was like, why do I care about this map? Like, what is what's what's engaging me? It looks really cool. It looks really engaging. But like, as far as uh, striking me emotionally or telling me something deeper, I I I was missing that. And so when when I go back to my friends like Curry and Mega, like, hey, we could do something, you know, probably better you know like this is cool front end but like let's let's tell a deeper story like let's let's pull on yeah. some heartstrings and let's let's have a little fun which goes back to uh, um what do you call the luminous trilogy and there's a, a scene where 
Um, he goes into a warehouse and he thinks he took acid and he hears voices and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the scene, it's that they did a whole like uh, theater, like they, they messed around with the sound and they changed the background. And so he didn't take LSD. It was just how his perception was and how they played the music and, and how they made the background change. And then I told my friend, like, this is exactly what we could do with our VR space is like play with the sound and, and then, make that i guess let's bring in uh curry because he had this idea of how he wants to represent sound in, in the space and create with it yeah we we talked about manifesting visual uh entities within a vr space based on the voice mm -hmm. uh i imagine there's already some like synesthetic experiments like that happening there, are, I mean, I've seen a few, and I think there probably should be more than there have been so far. Many people approach VR very representationally, and a lot of that's because, in fact, an empty VR space is downright terrifying. You really do want to populate it. You want to give it enough form that you don't feel like you're losing your grip on reality. Because yeah, you're just like in the void. <laughs> yeah, you're literally in the void. When we were getting started, one of the folks I was working with claimed, and I think quite clearly, he thought, you know, Mark, in the future, the black silence, silence of VR that we find so terrifying, people will be treasuring that because it will be considered relaxing. It's like taking a little holiday in the black. Well, you know, and I can I can see it in a very overheated media culture. I, I could see that. Yeah. Um well, that's the whole thing of the isolation chamber, uh, John C. Lilly. And then even Terrence says to take the mushrooms in total silence, absence of any uh, stimulant uh, to get a better bandwidth, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But this idea of synesthesia, you have to, I think it's a really good idea, but this is where you now start to have to be very careful because synesthesia I think particularly on people who haven't had any experience of it. For people who have, they kind of have frameworks for being able to work with it without being deeply freaked out. But I think for a lot of people who have never had it before, you have to be very gentle and very, I think, just connected and careful and loving with them so that they don't feel like they're losing their grip. Um, because it really does feel like getting at that sort of essential level where you're dealing with feedbacks in us. The sound of our own voice is one of the first things we become aware of as babies. And when you start to sort of permute that in a sensory way, you're touching on some things in us that are very deep and therefore very powerful. Yeah, and when I was talking to Curry about this and we go into um, just what we're imagining, I'm like, wait, I think we're just doing Iowa Scarrow songs. Like, isn't that what they teach you? Like, when you go there to like sing things into yeah. being, I'm like, I think that's what we're just mimicking. And this kind of yeah. goes into what you were saying about the development of technology and that we learn that we're um, just exploring um, internal parts of ourselves. And um, like the, the VR is an exploration of how perception works and, and then, uh, augmented reality is maybe this like first stage of like how do we actually design reality um in the sense of nanotechnology if we ever get or want to mess around in that realm <laughs> I, I had hoped how, well, being in the room as a lot of nanotechnology was kind of being mooted and developed this is in the early 80s at mit i had hoped that by now we would be further along with it it seemed like it was fairly straightforward, but it turns out that the nanoscale, like AI, like VR, is in fact a lot more rich than we understood when we were, when Feynman was writing, there's plenty of room here at the bottom back in the 1960s and things like that, when we were making our initial formulations of how it was going to work. Because I had really had expected that by now there would be a kind of seamless transition between the kinds of imaginal worlds that we'd be able to create in VR and AR and our ability to be quite plastic in reality. That reality would have a plasticity associated with it. And we should be clear, reality is far more plastic in 2021 than it was when I was born in 1962. 
right? Let's just get that out there. It certainly is. But I was expecting it to really have taken off by now, so much so that we were going to need all of these tools to help us navigate our way through it because the world was going to get so slippery. Yeah, and, and this is this uh, thing that I was um, realizing in reading your book about the boundaries that we have, or and I'm reading um, some of your other work, but the boundaries of uh, between the body, the physical, yeah. and then your psyche, and that you know with psychedelics, those boundaries, uh, at least in that moment of of it, it seems to dissolve, and you seem to to mirror and and talk to people within um, the heads and and have a intuitive sense of what's going on, and, and kind of go in this weird little automatic mode sometimes. Um, but that that's all to say that. I think what's happening culturally is these narratives are, are, are dissolving and the boundaries are getting a little loose. And this is why we see maybe the bad trip that we're having in, in a culture sense of like, because, you know, even, even to the extent of Black Lives Matter or even um, uh, the Trump and, and their stuff is like, they took a meme and then like manifested out into the streets and then like i don't i don't know it's like there was always this opportunity even in the beginning of covid where i felt like the whole world stopped and then we had like an intuitive sense that we we're like a collective and then like we could do anything but we just didn't have a big enough idea or or enough to oh, focus is that we totally did. Everyone's getting their vaccine shots now. We've never developed a global vaccine in a year. We yeah. we totally were like, wait, we need that. And everyone was on it. It's it is it's quite funny because you know, Americans have had vaccines for a couple of we uh, a couple of months now. We've only uh -huh. just started this week in Australia because there isn't any COVID in Australia. So there was no like, oh my God, we've got to do this and more people are gonna right. die. We, we were able to be a little bit more relaxed about it, but tr trust me, psychologically, it's an enormous relief to see old people getting vaccinated. Now, my mentor who lives in Connecticut has got his first shot this week. He's 73, and I cannot tell you how, how happy and just how much less nervous I feel about that. Um, but yes, in terms of having that moment of going, wait, there's a problem, we know how to solve this problem, let's just go solve it, we totally did that. Can we carry that moment forward to the great challenge? And everyone knows coming out of this, the great challenge of the next decade is climate. Everyone knows this, right? <laughs> There's no question about this. Everyone knows this. Can we have that same focus? Yeah. I, I think the thing is because it's like a more slow boil yeah. that it's harder mm -hmm. to have that yeah. scale of thought. And this is maybe where the uh, AI helps or, or the computers can help us with this kind of longer process of of thinking um, in, in, in these. Uh, right, and we, if we tie that back to what we were talking about earlier about helping the people who have memory problems, right? Using Facebook or Notepad to help them remember. Yes, exactly, to tie that in, in that sense, all of humanity has a memory deficit. We are very bad, and this is well known in psychology, right? We are very bad at forward planning beyond a certain horizon because it is difficult for us to conceive of it, and therefore we don't have frameworks for it. And so, yes, if we can use tools, but I think we can probably use one another for starters too, right? And we probably haven't been relying on that. We've been relying on a particular set of people who are so concerned about it that it becomes all they talk about and then it becomes easy to just ignore them rather than something that is commonly understood that is simply good manners. <laughs> right? Rather than something that requires that. And there is absolutely a space and a place for the, for the agitator and for the activist. You know, this is why Greta Thunberg has gotten the traction she has gotten, because she is exactly in the right place with the right message. But there's another place for all of the rest of us to be politely focused on all of this and to remind one another that it is polite to be focused on this. Yeah, this 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 thing goes into this other discussion I was having with a friend and about like this discipline that I, it seems that we lack in like this um, need for activism and the the movement that we kind of need in this moment. 
And I think it's true, but also too, I think it's true in in the sense that anywhere you go and talk to uh, talking to you or talking to Doug or even in in the team human or even in my everyday life, there's there's a credible amount of this like awareness of like what's going on um, about like I, I was saying like after this, there's this, this need to like commune with people, this need to kind of like have this set of like, what's important to you. Uh, you. You were saying about your old mentor and I have the same experience with having some relief with my older father who, who got the vaccine and and my, my grandma who I haven't seen in a while and just thinking of simple things that we, we want to do of like having a dinner and having family over and those little simple things that you miss with those people that you love and, and um, bringing it back to the body and how maybe, you know, when, when we were in that space of, of um, with Doug and Team Human, I was thinking this is funny because I've always talked about like breaking the format of the podcast, like this space of where you could roam around, broke the, like any format. And we were just like, where are we? Like, how do we get around? Where are you? How do we play Marco Polo? Marco. And it, we just, just being silly and like that, <laughs> you know, going back to the playful world and, yeah. and the kids understanding, um, in, in a sense, I, I had, I was, um, with this, this girl for, for a while and she had younger kids and they were playing games, like testing games, but all they wanted to do was like explore with like a no man's sky. And, and I was just amazed about these games were more about exploring and building stuff than it was just like shooting people. And I, I, you know, I am right there with them. I, I, because I sort of am from the before time of the first person shooter, they've never had uh, a, a thing for me. But this year, or really last year, was it August, Microsoft Flight Simulator, the new version 2020 came out. And you realize it's the entire world in high resolution, in real time with all of the weather patterns. So that people were storm chasing the hurricanes that were in the Gulf of Mexico with their little craft this year. And I looked at this and went, this is the first generation. The reason that I got into VR, the reason that it's become this kind of framing experience for my life is because I wanted to be able to build the kinds of tools that would allow us to apprehend the planet as a whole. Not only do we lack this ability to see things 10 years from now, we lack the ability to see things at planetary scale because we simply are not at planetary scale. Yeah, I could talk to people on the other side of the world, but it's still hard for me to conceptualize what that space is like. And for the first time, Microsoft made a toy out of it where the joy is just in exploring it, playing with it. And it's the same thing with No Man's Sky. Just get out there and explore and play and just have that. To me, those are the things that are, I guess, the closest to my own ideal for what play is. Yeah, because then that scaffolds into your your real life and this is something me and curry always talk about like the work play principle he even has his own word for it but of like how much of of what we do just having fun like this and curry doing his drawings and then made, later on i'll do a video edit of this is merely for the fun of it or for us going back and forth of having an excuse to to come and have these weird little talks and 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 do these things um you know, it's an excuse to to do it, and um, I think you know, for for me listening to you and Doug for a long time, it seems like this is you know, in a sense of high uh, volume of what you guys produce, but also the utilitarian value of having a podcast and talking to your friends and uh, doing this stuff. But it all comes down to the the body and the the being hearted with people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that you grow into in terms of your practice. Doug has always been, he's always had a knack at this, you know, and I'm always in awe at his ability to be able to do it. And I, I, and I take notes, trust me, I take notes on how he does things. But I think there's that, you know, and there's that natural tension, you know, 20 years ago, everyone was like, follow your bliss. And I'm not saying that's bad advice, but bliss is not the same thing as practice. And it's around where your bliss can lead you into a practice that is blissful. That if you can bring those together, then you're in a sweet spot. And I think no one 
is perfectly in that sweet spot. Doug and I are not, trust me. You know, there's still plenty of stuff to do that is not blissful. Unlike, for instance, this conversation, which is verging into bliss way a lot of the time. So we're kind of doing things right here. But that, that also, this is not every moment of the day for any of us. This gets to be an epiphany for us. And that's also important is that you get to have those things in the in to look forward to or to refer to or to share once you've done them. But I think that practice is the thing that you get over time. And if you can find what you are blissful practicing, then you've got something there. It took me not that long to understand that I love to write and I get to spend more and more of my time writing, but I also love to just communicate. So a podcast, I will write. And so there's fun in that, but then there's also the fun in reading it and sharing it and all of that. So there's extending it, but there's also fun in talking to bright, smart people and sharing their ideas. I'm a mix of introvert and extrovert. I like to work on my own ideas, but by golly, I like to be exposed to your ideas because I am not only just going to learn about them, but I'm going to get ideas of my own from listening to you. And this this kind of circles back to, you know, when I was talking about the original root of weird, of the magical practice of your own kind of bliss, but how that reflects out from the universe and how that reflects back to you. And are you in harmony with it? And there's like a dance that you go with it. And you know, a lot of times I say my own language of that I'm banging my head against reality or I'm not hearing the, the heartbeat of the universe. So I'm like getting out of step and, and then I'm getting frustrated with like, why am I not like getting emotion on whatever project or whatever thing? And then I'm thinking, oh, it's because I'm not like listening. I'm, I'm, I'm more forceful. I'm not like, like yeah. listening to the, to the songs <laughs> in a sense. And that is such a hard, because you're right, it calls for a certain quality of stillness that is also willing to accept that death of throwing out what you've done or stepping back. And that is just, you know, that's the constant process here. I wonder if we get more practice at it as we get older, but I don't think it gets any more pleasant <laughs> as we get older. That that's interesting about uh maybe you earlier you were saying something about um being polite or whatever that like you know do, forming these new habits that seem so natural to maybe someone younger and that that we need to be more aware so that we have a more focused practice of changing what maybe we took for granted before you know when we're talking about uh, this change and death that we need to move forward with. And so, you know, we were unaware of maybe of a lot of our habits and ways that we interact like collectively. And we're getting a, a very heavy dose of what's what that is about. And, you know, you see these kids and how they just, you know, and I mean, Doug and you guys talk about this, about like, you know, the digital natives, um, kids just gravitating uh, intuitively to whatever the new uh, context is they you know, you see two-year-olds take to a phone and they're, um, my grandma even tells a story about me when I was little and I taught her how to use a calculator. And for that, for that, that was like amazing for her. Uh, you know, she's like, oh, I, you know, he was like three years old. I didn't know he was using the calculator, right? And he showed me how to use it. And, but that's the story uh, that gets recycled over, you know, the little kid teaches the, the parent how to use the phone and that they have, and I think this goes into um, morphogenetic resonance and these larger pockets of ideas and how they gravitate. And then like, then it becomes more intuitive to, to, to more and more people. And it just seems that like, I don't know that in one sense, uh, the, the push and pull, cause like the kids, of, of this play and, and, you know, Meg earlier, we were doing our VR space and Meg's kid was playing with it. And she's going to make a list of like 20 things that we should do. And I, I guarantee 10 of them are going to be better than anything we could come up with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I mean, that's the beauty of the of the of the beginner's mind, right? She doesn't know a what's easy or hard, or b what you should or shouldn't do, right? So yeah. that's the, the beauty of it. I always loved going into students' VR works because I'd be like, well, I want to, but I want to do this. They're like, oh, we didn't think about that, right? Because you come in either with your own set of expectations or just you're, you want to bring your body in and you're trying to do something but you can't because they didn't put it in there even though you can do it with your body. It's all that stuff too. Yeah. Meg, oh, are, you, are you there? Meg? Yeah, I'm there. Did, yeah, uh, my, my, ult <laughs> my ultimate question, this is my ultimate question, is can AI robots feel love? Can they feel love? Can they tune into love? in a humanistic way. So you get to the core of, uh, it's kind of a version of what we would used to call the Turing test, right? Which is, can a machine be imagined to be thinking? And you can ask a philosopher like Daniel Dennett, whether in fact humans or a dog can feel love or whether they're just simulating it. And I guess the question there is, if you believe it is, is it? These are questions that Sherry Turkle has been grappling with, particularly in Alone Together, which is one of her recent books. She's got a new book coming out next week, which whose name escapes me, but she's exploring this again, where she takes a look at the kinds of emotional relationships people are having with technology. And we have to remember that one of the things that we bring to a relationship is ourselves, whether it's a relationship with an AI or with another human being. And so when you ask, can an AI feel love? Are you asking, can we know that it's feeling love? Or are you asking, can it act like it's feeling love? And those are yeah. different questions. And it's also hard to answer those questions mm -hmm. about ourselves. Yeah, and this goes into uh, a, a great, a great line that I, I love. Um, but it's it's not the dream that is real; it's the dreaming. Yeah. And so you know the active experience of it, and then like everything else from there is even even in the active experience is projection. But you know our memories of of what happened in the past is a simulation of what happened into the yeah. past. And then you, you get into Robert Downtown Wilson of like, uh, you can't get outside of the thinker. You're only projecting, you know, uh, the thinker upon the thinker when you think about, oh, is that person thinking this? But you're thinking of what that person's thinking and then you, you go into this loop of the yeah. thinker and, and the provider. <laughs> uh, um, Curry, did you have any last things that you wanted to bring up? Um, anything about your thoughts on our, our space and creativity. Um, I'm curious what kind of futures you typically imagine when you think about maybe a couple decades from now. Sometimes I wonder if uh, VR headsets will be as ubiquitous as cell phones. I also think about the limitations of the hardware and do, uh, do we as a civilization want to be mass producing headsets? Yeah. Is this the world we're moving to? Yeah. Or is there, I don't know, maybe maybe another thing we're not imagining yet? So, tell you a little story. Um, so I got to be quite good friends with Terrence McKenna before he passed. And he invited me to come down and spend, I don't know, 10 days with him. This is right before Christmas time in 1998. And he used to live sort of on the lower uh, Big Island down south of Kailua. And I had some yeah. friends who were visiting at the same time. And on the winter solstice, we decided we're gonna go up to the volcano. And we went up to the volcano and we walked across the one of the craters. And then we went down the chain of craters road to the place where there's this constant lava flow into the sea. And I remember walking on it. And I remember grabbing some of it. And a couple days later, I had, taken some ayahuasca. Imagine that when I was visiting Terrence. And I'm having a classic ayahuasca experience, but I'm also now looking at this piece of rock that I've taken from the volcano. Do you know what volcanoes spit out? 
they spit out silicon. Well, they spit out silica, but they spit out fairly pure silicon. And all my life, I've known exactly what silicon is good for. It is the substrata of computation. And I looked at this and went, wait a second, the earth is already a computer in some sense. It's already an information processing grid. It's all of these things. And it's the kinds of thoughts that you can experience when you're in an altered state of consciousness, but you can bring it back to the material object and go, yes, actually, I can see that. And so it's possible to imagine a future where augmentation is not necessarily so centered on the human being itself, but that it is something that is more pervasively a quality of the world. I don't necessarily know the path between here and there. And I don't know if it's going to be a good idea for us to be so egomaniacally focused on where we are as a species as opposed to where we all are as a planet. And I think that's kind of part of the course correction. That's kind of part of what politeness is in the future. So it's less a question about do we have this technology or do we have that? It's around how are we embedded in the matrix of all of the living and the quick? And have we changed the boundary between the quick and the dead? This, I think when I talk, when I listen to you talk about what, what we, the possibilities or what you see in AR and, and VR, um, especially AR, I think this could help hopefully see the connections that we have in our everyday life of how the chain reaction of, say, some of our decisions of how much power we're using or um, how much waste we're doing. And like these effects of like, I buy a fruit and then I look at it and I could see it's, it's, um, motion like okay this this apple came from middle america and it took this uh truck here and why do i need to buy that one when i could buy one that's but from down the street and then like having seen how all of that correlates i think that that could like open up um a, a step into seeing the ripples of of how our our actions do because that's uh, some sense that what we get in the psychedelic experience, you have some intuitive sense of how your mood is affecting someone else's and, and all this kind of stuff. And you have this, this sense of, I think in, in my small experience, uh, I say my, my birth of my psychedelic experience is in Santa Cruz and we hippie flipped. And I said before that I knew Gaia was a intellectual concept, but this was the first time I had the felt experience of it of like the earth moving and everything just like singing and, and like information come to me. I'm like, Oh, now I get what they say. Like, it's not an intellectual concept. Like I could feel it. I could, I, it's everywhere. It's and embodied think, knowledge. Yeah, embodied knowledge. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels like that is something that we can pass along that we can politely share, that we can also deed to the, to the generations who follow us is that kind of understanding and awareness. And that is a recovery of old knowledge. That is not, as you know, particularly new knowledge, right? That is a recovery of old knowledge that we forgot for a while. And to bring another one of the loops closed, if we've forgotten it because our minds aren't quite good enough, we can use the tools at hand and we can use each other to help us remember. Yes, um, uh, there's a, uh, a line that Doug said when I, I talked to him is that the first hearers um, understood the jokes. And I kind of love that of um, this understood or this embodied knowledge of kind of when you, whether it's you engage with an idea and you, you get to a level where you have it embodied, uh, whether through your practice or uh, through an experience of your life of having a felt experience, whether it's um, love or, or psychedelics or all sorts of different things, um, positive or negative, that can imprint onto you something uh, different. Yeah. And yeah. And there's the opening, right, is that 
we have the possibility of that experience. We have the possibility of working from that experience. So the, and not everyone's going to have the same experience here. That's also part of politeness. It's, it is funny because a big element of what Doug was talking about today was cutting other people slack, right? That their experience is not gonna be your experience and that is gonna be okay. And we all need to be cutting each, each other more slack around that. Because again, that's polite. <laughs> So some of the way through this, some of the way into a broader understanding is going to have to start with us being willing to tolerate a broader understanding with one another. If we don't get that right, we are never going to be able to get beyond it to a broader understanding of the earth. And this is the real test and, and lesson, you know, you, you learn it and it's ongoing practice. You learn it for yourself and then yeah. your own relationships between your loved ones and then it's and actually i like another line by doug that uh humanity doesn't uh scale it happens peer to peer which is so true <laughs> we have a huge problem with scale and we just need to bring it back down to peer to peer um, interactions as the most important of our um, bandwidth of what we think is important in our lives i think yeah yeah exactly although again politeness does scale. So there are certain oh. social features that do scale. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? So we, we don't want to necessarily throw it out, but I, I think I agree with him in that essential human act is a peer to peer act. It is not an act at scale. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a good place to start to wind down. I'm, I'm really glad um, that you gave some time to us and we had some fun and um, any last things Curry or Meg want to bring up before we end everything. No, I just want to say thanks for hanging out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, I've got nothing to add. <laughs> Great. It has it has been an absolute pleasure. It really has. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. Um, so we're we're going back out in to our everyday lives, and um, thanks for everybody being here. And I think just just this whole thing about being aware. And I want to go back to something that was in your book that I think is something I think I first got with Doug. It's the program or reprogram, but in your book, you you did write or who's, who's writing, uh, being written. Uh, and so this is this goes into playing in this space or, or consuming or being, you know, fed something. And so when this kind of goes to another Terrence McKenna thing I like is like, you know, you either uh, creating culture, or or you know, the culture is not your friend. But it, in the end, he says, create your own culture, your own friends, your your own roadshow, and that you start to weave your own narrative. And I think that's going to be important when we get into these spaces of where we're um, externalizing some of our imagination, and we're getting into spaces that maybe um we're disembodied though, even more than we are now <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean we'll see one of the great gifts of ar is that it's very embodied you don't have to give yourself up to get into ar you you're in the real world with your body and with everyone else and i think that's gonna make it an easier trip for people but it also means that's gonna make it easier to manipulate people so We'll see. We'll see. We need to be careful. I think we need to be optimistic, but we need to be careful. Yeah. And this, this goes back to this, this scary thing about advertisements, you know, they already have embedded advertisements with, with video, but imagine these embedded advertisements in, in AR, reality. And you're, yeah, you're not knowing that like what it, what's getting embedded in there. <sighs> yes. But that's for another time. Thank you a lot. And um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Oh, actually, you're you're starting your day right now. <laughs>